It's ready. Well, good evening. Appreciate the opportunity and the invitation uh, to talk to you. Uh, my name is Garth Ruff. I'm the beef cattle field specialist for OSU Extension. Uh, I've been in that role since September of last fall. Um, you know, it, with, you might recognize my predecessor uh, being from more over that area and John Grimes. Uh, previous to September, I was an uh, Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Henry County, um, up there in the northwest corner for about three and a half years. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, cattle selection and reproduction. Um, you know, and the reason we're going to talk about it, if we don't get our cows bred, none of the rest of what we talk about with regards to beef production really matters. Um, so we're going to start with some genetics um, and, and then move into some reproductive considerations. I'm going to put several protocols for artificial insemination on the screen. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through those. If you have specific questions, I'll be glad to answer those at the end. Um, but I can make an hour's talk at about 12 slides uh, if we really wanted to. So cow as a calf, uh, it really is a great thing. But we need to keep in mind there's certainly an investment uh, in that calf, you know, from mating to birth. We got a 283 day window. And from the time, if it's a heifer calf, from the time she hits the ground to the time she calves, we're looking at another 730 days. Uh, and then from calving to weaning that first calf, another 205 days if we're in a traditional system. So the minimum number of days from first conception uh, to the opportunity to get a return from that conception is roughly 1,218 days. So think about what it costs each and each of you to keep a cow, uh, develop heifers, uh, and those type of things as we go throughout this presentation. You know, so what have we done in terms of cattle breeding? Prior to World War I, uh, Shorthorn and Hereford were the predominant breeds in, in the United States. Uh, you know, I think those early pictures there um, are pretty representative in, of even today's cattle. Uh, and then, you know, in the mid 1900s, we brought in the Angus breed. Uh, we got cattle short, we got them stocky, uh, and we've since kind of moved away from that. Uh, and then we went from one extreme really to the other. And in, in the mid to late 80s, you know, they brought in the Kianias, they brought in the limousines, and we got you know, some of them frame cattle. You can see that picture of that key in the bull from the National Western in 1986. We can't even see the guy showing it. Um, you know, so how good have we done, you know, in 100 years time? When we talk about phenotype, I don't know that this picture is a whole lot different than that short horn bull from 1911 in terms of type and kind. But I think we can make an argument that our genetics are much improved uh, in that 100 plus years since. So when we evaluate cattle, we're looking at phenotype, kind of like what we just scrolled through there. EPDs as expected uh, progeny differences. We can use ultrasound as a tool to measure carcass traits uh, and, and more and more popular DNA testing and genomic considerations. As we look at EPDs, you know, that's an expected performance difference between progeny and, and an animal, whether that's a cow or heifer or bull. Um, you know, and if we think about it, uh, you know, that average EPD is zero, that might not be a breed average, but if we think as EPDs separate from the animal, uh, the average is gonna be zero and kind of that breed average is kind of that base point that might be fixed or float uh, depending on genetic improvement. So, you know, beginning at EPDs, we started sire evaluation programs in the 1980s, uh, only using progeny information um, and that was a real challenge because we could not calculate EPDs for a younger breeding stock. We had to prove those bulls. You know, in the dairy industry today, they still prove many bulls. Um, and then we got to the point where we could use some ancestor data. So what impacts an EPD today? Well, it's the pedigree. It's the performance of that individual animal. It's the performance of their progeny. And... Now we can use genomic test results to improve the accuracy of an EPD, and we'll talk about that. 
So if you're making sire selections or, or mating decisions, do we need a map? Well, that cattle roadmap, so to speak, started out as a sire evaluation report where we have sire summaries for each individual, uh, each individual bull for production traits, maternal traits, um, carcass, and then depending on the breed, some index traits. And the nice thing about a sire summary is we can, you know, especially now with the internet, compare many bulls uh, on one sheet of paper. We also have breed averages to consider. Uh, as we look at those sire summaries, the breed average of current sires, uh, supplemental sires, non-parent bulls and cows as well. And, you know, I use the Angus Association examples here because in terms of EPDs and entry points of data, um, they by far and away have the biggest data set of any of the respective breeds. And then, you know, the uh, percentile ranking of a given sire, are they in the top 1% for a given trait, a top 20% uh, or, you know, the top 95% uh, not necessarily being a good thing. Uh, but we can use percentile rankings to uh, select either extreme bulls for one trait or another, often maternal traits or carcass traits, or we can uh, use those rankings to get a real balanced bull, depending on what our goals are from our genetic program. EPD accuracy is that relationship between the estimated EPD and the true uh, EPD of that animal. As accuracy gets closer to one, that indicates higher reliability. Um, and you can see here, you know, how accurate are they? Um, and really what we do is accuracy increases, our margin of error decreases. And we can improve accuracy by increasing the number of data points uh, of progeny that have been tested. You know, so to get from a 0.1 to a 0.2 for a highly heritable trait or a low heritability trait, um, you know, it only takes one more data entry. So we can, with confidence, typically have pretty high accuracies for maternal traits, things such as birth weight, car uh, yearling weight. The tougher ones to get are, are those carcass data. Um, and that's often because we don't have good enough records or traceability uh, from the farm to the packing plant. Um, yes, you know, they are expected progeny differences. They're not hard and firm. You know, we've all heard stories that low birth weight bull, uh, you know, where there's a 140 pound calf <laughs> uh, pulled out of a cow, uh, but they are a tool. Uh, and from a good breeding program, I think they can be a useful tool. When to collect data, if you want to collect data on your own herd, uh, you can see that there are birth weights within 24 hours. Uh, mature cow data within 45 days of weaning, uh, ultrasound for carcass traits, uh, somewhere around a year of age. And we also need to consider the environment and the management style that those animals were in. Um, so if we're going to select uh, a herd sire, we really want to compare him not only against the breed, but against his contemporaries that were raised in a similar environment. You know, in terms of management, uh, Ideally, it's not fair to compare bulls that were weaned, uh, you know, in different months, you know, because we have different forages and feed programs, uh, were they natural service calves or embryo transfer. Uh, and then we have this tool uh, that the Beef Improvement Federation updates about once a year, and it's at crossbreed EPDs. Uh, where we use the Angus breed at, as a base value, and then we adjust plus or minus um, for any of the other given breeds. So in this case, uh, birth weight in terms of pounds, we would expect a Charlet uh, to be 8.8 .8 pounds, Charlet calf 8.8 .8 pounds heavier than an Angus. We can see our genetic trends for birth weight um, have decreased slightly for some breeds and maintain pretty steady for others. Yearling weight has increased, so we've increased performance while still maintaining acceptable birth weights. Um, and we've kept milk, <coughs> improved it in some breeds, and kept it fairly steady for others. 
you know, so you need to know where your herd is in relation to your breeding goals and targets uh, and make genetic selections based on the market and the calves that you produce for. You know, for small scale commercial producers, a lot of times we talked about those balanced trait cattle. Um, but if we're maintaining or retaining ownership, you know, and then we care more about growth. Uh, if we're going to market those cattle on a value based grid, then we care more about carcass quality. If we're going to maintain and raise our own replacements, then we got to consider uh, the maternal traits. Uh, and then for the show cattle, that's more of a phenotype market. You know, so really the next generation starts at the point in time where we purchase that bull. Uh, in terms of carcass EPDs, we can use uh, in-plant carcass data. We can use ultrasound or those genomic results. Uh, and genomics has really helped us improve the accuracy of our carcass data it, across, all, across all breeds. Here where we have carcass data with accuracies of, accuracies of 0.05, because like I said earlier, we don't get a whole lot of scan data. Uh, it's tough to get that in plant data, but by adding genomics alone, we can increase those accuracies by uh, upwards of 25 to 30%. So here's a cow um, that went from uh, ultrasound data and scans of 13 calves at an accuracy of 0.25. Uh, when we add genomics, that accuracy rate increases to 0.37 and that marbling EPD also increases almost doubles. So to achieve herd reproductive efficiency, we're gonna kind of switch gears here. We have to have proper management. Uh, you know, we talked about genetics, but we also got to select a breeding strategy. Um, we need to realize when we have infertility issues uh, and sound selection criteria to identify those fertile females. Here are some benchmark goals uh, from a widely accepted paper here. Pregnancy rate for cows in a 60-day breeding season. Our goal should be 90 to 95% with a critical limit of 85 uh, you can see there's a similar thing for heifers in a 45-day breeding season. Uh, less than 2% abortion should be a goal. A calving rate of 80 to 85%. We know that we're going to lose some pregnancies. Our calving interval should be 12 months or 365 days from one calf to the next. Uh, and really, if we're not weaning a 75% calf crop, we're probably not making a whole lot of money um, when we talk about the economic side of this. There are certainly advantages to a short breeding season, uh, and that's those uniform calves and weaning. Uh, and by having uniform calves, if we manage them correctly, we can capitalize on a variety of premiums uh, at the point of sale. And it also makes it easier to manage our cows and select root replacement heifers of a similar age. Um, so as we look at the use of breeding practices across the United States, uh, we do have some differences here. Um, and as you would expect, you know, 95% of herds or operations um, are using the bull uh, to get those females bred. Um, less than 5% AI, and that's probably a little higher here in Ohio, where our average herd size is significantly lower uh, than it is in the West. Um, then we get a slight increase of herds that are utilizing both uh, natural service and artificial simulation. So let's talk about using the bull, bull breeding. Come on. You know, why is that bull important? Well, the bull influence is influences overall herd fertility more than any single animal. This is per, pretty logical, right? A cow is typically going to have one calf versus a bull who's going to sire multiple calves. And then a lot of herds, they couldn't be the primary or sole source for genetic improvement. So what are we going to ask of our bulls? Well, first and foremost, we have to have high fertility. And then ideally, we have good genetics, like we discussed on how to make those selections. Um, not only do we need to consider performance data, pedigree, um, temperament, docility, becoming even more of an important trait, mature frame size and body weight. Um, 
than how they did in terms of a breeding soundness exam. When we talk about those breeding soundness exams, they need to be performed yearly by a qualified veterinarian. Uh, and each year, somewhere around 60 days prior to the breeding season. Uh, if a bull fails, we can retest them 60 days later. Uh, but if you've been following the auction prices, the price of a call bull these days, I don't know that I'd worry about retesting him uh, when he's worth 75 cents to a dollar a pound. And we know that one in five bulls are going to be less than satisfactory uh, in terms of both a physical exam and semen analysis. So the cardinal principles of that exam is animal physically sound in terms of feet, legs, uh, is he reproductively sound in terms of scrotal circumference, testicle size, uh, and does he have good semen quality? What we typically don't know is how many cows can he serve. Um, here's a study from Western uh, Canada where 22% of bulls had at least one physical abnormality, whether that be a short scrotum, bad feet, uh, posty legs, puffy hawks, whole variety of things. When we talk about subtle scrotal circumference, we know that it highly correlates to the onset of pu puberty in both bulls and heifers. Uh, and, and of course, sperm production. Uh, and it's fairly highly heritable, 0.68 out of one. Uh, some minimums uh, based on the Society of Theory Genealogy who uh, uh, trains veterinarians to perform breeding soundness exams. Uh, you know, a 15 month of bull should have a scrotal um, of about 30 centimeters. And you can see that increases as the bull's age increase. Have we made uh, progress in selecting for scrotal circumference over the years? Uh, this is a summary of the data from 1972 to 1998 and 2006 to 2011. And you can see there for all breeds, we have increased scrotal circumference. So when we talk about the semen test part of that exam, we're looking not only at volume, the concentration, the gross motility, how does that sperm move across the slide, individual motility, and then morphology. Do we have uh, abnormal heads, abnormal tails? Are those sperm cells uh, swimming in circles? Those kind of things. This slide covers the economic loss of subfertile bulls. Um, and you can see there, at 70 versus 50% first service pregnancy rate over 40 cows. Uh, the total pounds lost is right around 1,025, excuse me, kilograms uh, or 2,255 pounds of weaning weight if that bull cannot perform that first service at a high rate. So most bulls, uh, maybe more so in the West, <coughs> excuse me, are sold as yearlings. We might have more 15 month to two year old bulls here in Ohio. Um, and, you know, and that's in order to capture genetics in that new, new generation. Uh, and about two thirds of our bulls are fertile or mature at 14 months. But a common reproductive failure, um, you know, only about 35% of 12 month old bulls produce good quality semen, about 60% of 14 month old bulls. And once we get those bulls to about 16 months old, that increases to 95%. Um, you know, really we need to monitor body condition score, nutritional management of our bulls, um, excess fat cover. You know, it's no different than saying fat cows make no money, uh, neither do fat bulls or extremely thin bulls. You know, so not only do we need to make sure that he can get a cow bred, um, you know, we, we need to make sure that he wants to. So that raises the question, well, how many cows or what should my cow to bull ratio be? Um, you know, it depends on the age of the bull, the size of your pasture, larger the pasture, uh, more bulls you're gonna need. Uh, but typical, we're looking at somewhere of one bull to 25 to 35 cows, some high fertility age bulls, uh, you know, three years plus typically do have you know, the want to and desire and capabilities to cover up to 50 cows. Um, so you can see here for bull breeding, we're looking at those younger bulls, one to 15 to one to 20. Um, then as those bulls get older, uh, we can increase the number of cows we expose to them. 
What about when we synchronize? Well, we can look at the different bull ratios here, um, you know, and really one to 50. Uh, that's probably pushing it, uh, especially if we synchronize those cows. You know, they're, if they all come into heat the same day, there's just no way uh, that, that bull's going to get 50 cows bred. Uh, but if we look at some shorter ratios, uh, one to 16 and one to 25, we can still have pretty high performance if we synchronize those cows. Uh, clean up bulls, if, if you've got the ability to use fixed time AI, uh, breed every cow once uh, and then turn that bull out, um, you know, a cow to bull ratio of one to 28 or so, assuming that we get, uh, you know, 50 to 60% of those cows bred is fine. Let's talk about artificial insemination. There's a whole variety of reasons why um, we can use artificial insemination. You can see them there on the screen. Um, you know, and, and depending on the number of cows, uh, the return on investment can be fairly high. But with artificial insemination, you know, it's, it's not foolproof. We do have to detect heat or estrus. Uh, and some producers are very good at it and some are not. It's not necessarily their fault, but you know, we need to observe those cows 20 to 30 minutes. They need to be in a place of good footing. Uh, and more often than not, we need to use estrus detection age. And there's a whole variety of them there. And the reason to use those aids is because there's great va variability in the time of day that both heifers and cows uh, come into a standing heat. Uh, a very common tool um, that I've seen is these estrotech patches. You know, and now they even kind of have this black circle on them. They call it the bullseye, um, which is 50% of that patch. If 50% of that patch is rubbed off, uh, we can go ahead and breed those cows. Uh, you know, if it's a, if we see them in heat in the AM, it's bring them in the PM kind of kind of scenario. These old Kmar patches, uh, kind of similar. They break that tube of ink. They turn red. Uh, tail paint, if we're going to use tail paint, we need to make sure we get it in the right location. So some deficiencies, you know, the cow stands, most cows stand in heat for a relatively short period of time. You know, what if they come into heat during the night? Uh, you see that patch worn off in the morning. Um, you know, when do you know to, when to breed that cow? Too many groups, too many animals in a group are not enough. You know, if you've only got five cows in a group and none of them are super aggressive, uh, even though they are in heat, but if there's nobody to, to do that mounting and riding, uh, you, you're not going to know it. And then the weekend syndrome, uh, you know, we tend to not monitor things as well. Or maybe uh, corn planter or combineitis catches us during the breeding season. So estrus detection alone is labor intensive. Uh, so what are some alternatives? And that's to synchronize estrus and decrease the days that we are required or should be required to detect heat. We can do that with a variety of products. One of those is uh, you know, prostaglandin or PGF2 alpha. And just by simple synchronization, we give them a shot at day zero, uh, a shot somewhere day 11 to 14. Then we're going to detect estrus and AI those cows, and 60% of them uh, in this scenario that were synchronized came into estrus within seven days of a 21 day cycle. That method is simple, relatively cheap, but it does require estrus detection. We can look at a synchronization program using GNRH and a seeder uh, and increase that to 80% in the first five days. That cedar is that uh, inner uterine device that's going to release uh, progesterone. Uh, we can get 80% of those cows in this particular study uh, come into estrus within five days. <coughs> uh, so, another op option is to eliminate the need for estrus detection, and that's utilizing fixed time artificial insemination. Uh, so what we're doing is controlling the growth of the follicle uh, in that endocrine environment to achieve synchronization and uh, ovulation at predetermined times. 
And if you don't have a chute or good handling facilities, uh, you got one or two options here. Consider investing in them, or you're probably not going to pay attention to the next few slides because um, it does involve handling the cows, running the cows through a chute, uh, giving anywhere from one to three, maybe four injections, and in implanting and pulling a cedar. Uh, so if we're going to use GNRH, we're going to induce ovulation in that existing follicle. And that new wave of fo follicles is going to appear. Um, we're going to have a um, corpus luteum. And we're going to induce ovulation of our pre-programmed follicles. And that's using the cedar in between. And then what the cedar is going to do is prevent early heat after that first shot of GNRH. So we're talking about breeding cows all at the same time on the same day. Um, do cows bred on the same day, calve on the same day? No, but 80% of them are going to have four days plus or minus um, relative to that due date for 283 day gestation. So we look at, uh, there's a lot of these protocols to choose from and I'll be glad to answer some questions, but I encourage you to go to beefrepro.org. Uh, and they're going to cover them uh, and you can study the timing and methodology of each of those protocols. The cows, we have a seven day co-sync and a five day. Uh, the difference here is we are to give two shots of that PGF2 alpha um, after we pull that cedar eight to 12 hours apart. A lot of that work was actually done here at Ohio State, Dr. Mike Day uh, to develop that program. And you can see a seven day co sync fixed time AI, um, weight conception rate of 54%, um, and a five day of 64%. As we talk about cows, um, you know, here comes that discussion. You know, do we really have to give them two shots of that prostaglandin? Can we give both doses at once, or can we give a single dose? Um, you can see here the single dose only resulted in 48% pregnancy, significantly, statistically significantly lower uh, versus if we give those shots eight hours apart or we give both doses at the same time. Uh, five versus the six day. Uh, the six day is kind of a newer protocol um, and there's even a, a newer one out, kind of what they call it the seven and seven. Um, like I say, I encourage you to look those up. Heifers. We got similar program, uh, seven day versus a five day. Um, and here with the five day, we can increase pregnancy rates uh, in this study over several cows by 10%. So the benefits of fixed time AI, no heat detection, we're utilizing GNRH to induce ovulation. We're gonna bring those cows at a certain time. You know, if we AI 12 hours after we detect esters, that's gonna require heat checks twice daily. We're gonna be breeding at potentially all times of the day. Now we will have good conception rate. You know, any cow that's in standing heat, we know has a better chance to get bred. Uh, so we do have the potential to use a combination of both systems as those cows come into estrus. Uh, you know, keep in mind, uh, the successes and the details, you know, whether that's record keeping, how we handle our semen, uh, frozen semen, what kind of nutrition state are those cows in? Are they heifers or cows? What does postpartum and estrus look like? Um, heat stress, some environmental factors. Well, let's consider some of the factors that are going to affect reproductive performance. And one of those is the varying reproductive classes within the cow herd. We know that in any given herd, we're going to have cows that are uh, cycling, heifers that are cycling, and then both cows and heifers that are um, either doing an estrus or in the case of heifers, they never, they haven't started cycling. This is going to depend a lot on age, calving difficulty. Uh, we know that if we got pull that calf, that cow is likely to have a longer an estrus period. Uh, you know, do we have a short calving window? Those type of things. Um, so we know uh, an estrus in terms of beef cattle at the start of breeding, um, you know, we could have up to 50% uh, 
of postpartum cows that are not cycling um, 56 days post calving. And that becomes a challenge because our challenge is to maintain a 365 day calving interval. Let's assume gestation is gonna be 280 days. That gives us 40 days to return to cyclicity, return to that uh, ester cycle. And then that gives us 45 days to get that cow pregnant. Postpartum and estrus, uh, we can't avoid it, but we can't manage it. Um, you know, and to maintain that 12 month calving window, we've got to get uterine involution completed, you know, getting that uterus back to the size where it can uh, maintain the next pregnancy. We got to resume ovarian function, that's follicle development. Uh, then those cows need to ovulate and become bred all within 80 day, 85 days. Uh, post calving. Factors that can affect the length of anastrus, of course, parity. We think the two-year-olds, uh, those first calf heifers are always the most challenging to get rebred. Uh, and a large part, large part of that is not only do they have to maintain uh, lactation, they're still growing, all right? They're gonna calve at you know, somewhere around 85% mature weight. So we not only have to maintain lactation, we got to promote growth. <coughs> and a lot of that's going to be determined by nutrition. Uh, so the most important factor of fluency in pregnancy uh, is our body reserves uh, at calving. So having cows in appropriate body condition score, um, ideally in a five or a six, um, that's going to get our postpartum interval down to 50 to 60 days. <laughs> We can reduce the postpartum interval with a cow at a seven, but just keep in mind um, those cows in heavier condition are tougher to get uh, to confirm pregnant. Effective body condition score uh, at different times on that uh, cyclicity. Uh, we know that uh, you know fatter cows. Uh, do return to estrus faster uh, than potentially thin cows. And kind of the same story here. Um, this is pregnancy rate. And it, this is a case not to maintain over conditioned cows because that pregnancy rate um, at the time of breeding is you know about 14, 15% lower. Uh, so this was a study done by uh, Dr. Alvaro Garcia Guerrera, a reproductive specialist at Ohio State when he was in Canada. Um, and this is kind of the value of preg checking. Uh, average herb size of 163 cows and a pregnancy rate of 92%. Uh, based on body condition scores, right? If they're greater than five uh, at various periods. Skip through that one there. So when we think about how we need to manage nutrition. Uh, you know, we need to save those best forages uh, for the third trimester when that fetus is experiencing rapid growth um, and post calving up through peak milk lactation in about 60 days or peak milk production. You know, uh, an Angus based cow. At peak milk, you know, we're going to produce 18 to 20 pounds of milk at peak lactation. Uh, postpartum interval and the probability of getting pregnant. We know the longer that, uh, you know, the longer that cow has post calving uh, to the time we breed her, we know the longer that time is, our increase of pregnancy increases. And keep in mind, we want to maintain a 365 day calving window. So at 45 days postpartum and between 45 and 80, you can see over there, we got between a 45 and 65% of getting that cow bred. This is Ohio State data. Uh, but if we synchronize those cows, and I'm gonna have plenty of time left open here for questions and discussions. I know we left a lot of things, went through some things very quick. Uh, and that's all right. I told you I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on those protocols and getting into the nitty gritty. 
so as we kind of wind things down here, um, certainly encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and, you know, and as we look at this slide, when we pre-synchronize those cows between 45 and 80 days, we increase that chance of getting her pregnant. Um, you know, from 45% low end to 55, roughly, um, and then 65 uh, versus 50, all right, by pre-synchronization. Um, you know, once we get to 100 days, there's probably not a whole lot of value in synchronizing cattle, uh, unless they are in an estrus. You know, we do that some with sows in, on our swine farms, the ones that don't return to estrus within, you know, usually a week, we do kind of try to jumpstart that if it's a good young female. Um, but with cows, uh, that's a little tougher to do, right? And maintain a, a close, tight breeding and calving season. Uh, just a slide that I, you know, I, I think as we look at cow-calf production here in this state, um, you know, in, in terms of making changes, uh, sometimes we don't let economics and efficiency drive those decisions. Uh, you know, and we need to be critical of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and maybe not do things the way we did last year if there's an opportunity to improve. So JT, I know that's a lot of information really fast uh, and they're gonna have that recording available to them. Uh, but I'd certainly like to have any discussion and entertain questions. I think when we talk about reproduction, um, you know, addressing those individual questions and concerns is probably more valuable to me flipping through some slides. Okay, I'll go ahead and hit the stop recording now, and then we can go ahead and do the questions.